Hey everyone, my name is Jonathan. In this video, we are going to create this nice and clean note taking desktop app called Notemark. Notemark features many cool functionalities, such as a real time markdown editor that every time we type some markdown content inside it, it will be immediately formatted into the proper markdown styling. Also, it's gonna have an automatic saving system that will save the content of the notes completely automatically. And finally, we'll also persist all of our notes as files stored in our file system, like any real notes application does it. Before starting, let me give you a quick demo of Notemark. To create a new note, we can just click on the sidebar top left button, Type a name for our note and create it. On the right side, we have our note editor where we can insert some markdown content inside it. You can see as our content is immediately turned into formatted markdown. We can also scroll through the list of notes that we have already created and select the one we want to view or edit. And finally, we can also remove the currently selected node just by clicking on the top right button. We are gonna build this application using Electron, a framework for building desktop application using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We're gonna also use React for creating our UI components, TypeScript for having type safety support, Tailwind CSS for styling, Jotai, a simple and powerful React state manager, and finally, a third party component called MDX Editor to integrate our Note Editor. So, without further ado, let's get started. Okay, the first step will be generating our Electron project, and for doing that, we are gonna open up our terminal and let's type in yarn create at quick start forward slash electron. Basically here we are using a build tool called electron bit, which is a modern tool for generating electron application based on bit. So here we are prompt to insert our project name and we are gonna insert node dash mark, so node mark. We are gonna use React as a framework TypeScript support, and we don't want any updater plugin and any mirror proxy. Great, so let's cd inside this new created application and let's install all the dependencies. So, while the dependencies are installing, I'm going to explain quickly how this Electron Bit works. So, Electron Bit basically it scaffolds an Electron project by using a Bit as a bundling tool. So, we this project are going to inherit some of the benefits of it, like odd module replacement, odd reloading, and also support for TypeScript, React, Vue, Svelte, etc. The nice thing is that our Electron project will be already scaffolded nicely, so we don't have to worry about to configure properly the project because uh, this tool will do everything for us. So the dependencies are installed, so we can open up this project on the editor. So let's open up a folder. Let's go under project, YouTube, note mark, and let's open it up. Okay, so this is our initial Electron project. You can see there are many configuration files, there are many folder, but let's get a quick overview on how this project has been scaffolded. So you can see, uh, we have some file relating to the code base configuration, such as ESLint configuration or Rettier configuration. We are gonna see soon how to uh, set up those files. We have an electronbuilder.yaml, which is um, a configuration file for when we are gonna have to build up our application for being packaged as a desktop application. We have a specific file for managing the Vit configuration along with uh, an Electron environment. And finally, we have 
some TypeScript configuration file. And here you can see that we have two separate TypeScript configuration, one for Node environment and one for the web environment, which is related to our browser window process. So the main core of this uh, project structure is under the source folder, where we have three main folder, the main, reload, and renderer. In order to explain these three folder, I found an image that will gonna help us uh, understand how an Electron project works under the hood. Okay, so an Electron application is basically divided into two main process, the main process and the render process. The main process runs in a Node.js environment and has access to the Node.js API along with the Electron main process modules. This process is useful for running privileged operation such as, for example, accessing to the file system and perform operation such as reading a file, writing a file, deleting a file or whatsoever. So it basically is um, like a context isolated process to run a restricted operation. Then we have our renderer process, which is basically our browser window and it basically is where our application lives. So this process is divided in two parts. On the right parts, we have our entry point for our application, which is the index.html, which then connects to an index.ts, where we basically run our web framework, in our case, uh, React. And we have also uh, this left part, which is called uh, the preload script. The preload script basically have access to the a restricted set of function from the Node.js API, has access to the DOM API. But the most important part is that uh, is able to access uh, a channel called IPC. This channel is used by the preload script to communicate to the main process. And this will be one of the most important part of our application because we, at some point, we will want to like create files, write files, you know, delete files uh, to store our nodes on the file system. But the only way to perform this kind of operation is to like communicate our main process to do that. And the only way to communicate to this main process is using this IPC channel. So let's quickly recap. We have the main process that runs a restricted operation and the renderer process, which is divided by our React application lift along with the preload script. If we go back to our Electron project, you can see that we have three separate folder, one for each of the roles that we have seen in the previous image. So we have a folder which contain the index.ts of the main process. We have a preload folder which contains all the files related to the preload script. And finally, a renderer folder where our React application basically will live. So you can see that we have another source folder inside. And here we have an initial React project that the application already created for us. And you can see that we have the entry point, which is the index.html. Uh, which links to the main.tsx, and this main.tsx basically runs uh, React under the hood. And so at this point, we can start to try to run this application and see what happened. We can run the command yarn dev. And you can see that our application has been started. So this is our, like, a sample application but it's basically, you know, a desktop application completely functioning. We have some, I think that these are some links to original documentation of the Electron Vit tool. And yeah, it's working fine. So let's go ahead and start working on this uh, project. Let's start by configuring our Prater configuration in order to have our files formatted nicely every time we hit save and in order to having a consistent format throughout all this file. In order to do this, we have to open up the .vscode folder, 
open up the setting.json and here I'm going to paste a basic configuration for, you know, uh, Pretter. Uh, great, so that was it for this file. And if we open up the Pretter RC, we can see that the Electron Vit build tool has already a pre-configured Pretter RC configuration. We can just use this configuration and don't worry about it. Uh, same for the Pretter Ignore, we can leave uh, as is. Uh, next step will be adding some ESLint rules. As you can see here also Electron Vit has an initial configuration, but we can enhance it a bit. So let's go ahead. So we basically add this uh, rules configuration where we basically turn off some rules to enhance our code experience. So yeah, that was also hit for this ESLint configuration. Okay, next step will be configuring our main process. So let's open up main index.ts and let's give it a look to this file. We have already some configuration going on and it is like the configuration that Electron Vit has applied for us and actually is actually quite complete. So let's give it a quick look. For example, here we are basically creating our window. We are assigning a width of 900, height of 670. We are already setting uh, an icon for Linux environment. We are hiding the menu bar and also we are setting the web preferences. Let's give a quick look to the other configuration that has been already added. For example, here we are showing the main window only when it's ready to be shown. Here, for example, we are denying the possibility to create a new window. And this is okay for our application because we don't need any separate window beside the main one. Here, we are just uh, loading our index.html uh, file when everything is ready. What we are doing here is saying that when the app is ready, we can start by setting the user model ID. We are creating the window. This uh, code snippet right here is saying that every time that we click on our application, we are gonna run this code. And basically we are saying, hey, if we don't have any windows available, uh, create a new windows. This is especially useful if we have our, you know, uh, application already opened up. So if it's already opened up, the this dot length will be uh, greater than zero. So we don't have to create a new window. And finally, we have this uh, event that basically quit our application when all the windows are closed, except on macOS. And this is a common behavior for, you know, macOS desktop application. Anyway, this file is already uh, commented, so you can take your time to read this pre-built comments that was added by the tool that we are using for creating this project. So uh, what I'm going to do now is going inside the web preferences and basically enable the sandbox and set it to true and also enable the context isolation setting also to true. So these two properties are super important uh, because we'll enhance the security of our application. For example, the context isolation will make the JavaScript context of the render process separated from the main process. And we also have the sandbox uh, properties, which will uh, permit us to sandbox our uh, render process to make it more uh, secure. Okay, so that's it for now for the main process configuration and we can move on. Next step will be configure our preload script. So let's open up preload slash index.ts. What we are going to do here is to remove everything and let's add a custom script. So the first thing that we are going to do is to check that we are running in a context isolated environment. 
where we are going to say if we are not in a context isolated, we are going to throw uh, a new error, which is going to say uh, context uh, isolation must be enabled in the browser window. Second step will be adding a try catch where we are going to use the context uh, bridge where we are going to expose a um, variable called context. For now, we are going to leave it empty. And later on, we are going to add all the necessary things that uh, we need here. So let's also add a catch statement where we console log any possible error that can occur. And the same way, we need to go inside the index.d.ts which basically defines some global type configuration in order to have TypeScript support every time we want to call any of the function that will be available inside here. So we don't want to export this uh, Electron API since we don't need it for this project, but actually we are going to rename this to uh, context and we are going to have for now just um, an empty object but later we are gonna have some uh, properties and function and they basically this TypeScript configuration and especially this context field is the same that we are basically exposing in the main world throughout this context bridge so for now let's leave it like this and we can move on to the um, like to the core part of this project, which is the renderer folder. So let's close up this tab and let's concentrate in the renderer folder. Okay, let's go ahead and let's start by taking a look at this index.html file. So this is a basic uh, index.html file, which is the entry point for our uh, renderer process. And Okay, so we can start by removing some uh, things that we, we don't need, like the title and this comment right here. And also we can change these uh, content security policies and adding a custom one, which I'm going to uh, copy, uh, just copy and paste it uh, here. So what I've done is adding a custom content security policies to uh, make our application work with some of the libraries that we are going to uh, work on uh, soon. Okay, so inside the body we can see that we are linking to this script, which is the main.tsx, which is just right here. So this main.tsx is basically where we are going to run our React application. Yeah, actually we can like start removing uh, some unnecessary file, like inside the asset folder. Uh, we can remove these icons. Okay, inside the index.css, we can clear out the, uh, the entire content because here uh, we are going to use Tailwind for managing the style of our application. Uh, inside the components folder, we can remove this uh, version components. It's, we don't need it. And now let's open up this app.tsx. Let's remove this import. And actually, let's remove all the content inside. Yeah, we can just remove also this and also this uh, class name. Okay, now we have a clean installation and we are ready for start working on our application itself. Okay, let's go ahead and let's start by scaffolding our renderer project. So let's close this app.tsx tab. What we are going to do is having like multiple folder under the source folder of the renderer project where we are going to store different type of files. For example, under the components folder, we are going to store all of our React components. And let's create an index.ts file where we are going to use this file to export all of our React components from a single entry point file. Okay, next step will be creating a Nux folder. This Nux folder will be used to collect all of our uh, custom hook. 
Then we're gonna have a store folder. We are gonna use Jodai as our state manager. And inside the store folder, we gonna collect all of the atoms that Jotai used for managing his internal state. And finally, we also have another folder called utils, where we are gonna store some utility function that we are gonna use throughout this project. Okay, that was it for our uh, renderer project. We have to create also another uh, fold called shared that will contain uh, like configuration file, function types uh, that are going to be shared amongst these three uh, folders right here. So main, preload, and renderer. Great, that was it for our project scaffolding. What we have to do now is update our TypeScript configuration and in order to add some path aliases. So let's start by editing our tsconfig.web.json. This TypeScript configuration is mainly used by our renderer process and preload uh, uh, process. So let's go ahead and under the include uh, field, let's add a new entry, which will be source chart. And then we are gonna set this uh, pattern. And basically here, what we are doing is including all the folders and subsequent uh, files that we are gonna place under the shared folder. So that basically uh, the renderer and preload will have access to this file uh, that we have de declared inside the shared folder. Okay, next step will be adding some properties under compiler option. For example, we need to add the no unused locals and set it to false. Under the paths field, we are gonna add some uh, some new path aliases. Will be these two, which I'm going to uh, paste it here. So we basically had the uh, shared for, uh, path aliases and also the head slash uh, path aliases. So every time in an import, we um, import from head slash and something else. We actually uh, meaning that we want to import from this folder right here, which is source render source. So basically we are uh, saying that we want to import from under this part right here. So we have to do the exact same thing for the tsconfig node.json, which is a TypeScript configuration that this time is not used by the render and preload, but is used by the main uh, process. Great, so, so let's go here and we have to do the exact same thing we did for the tsconfig.web.json. Um, actually, let me just uh, format this document with JSON. Uh, great. So we include the source shared to include every file we uh, declare inside the shared folder. And what we have to add is adding a base uh, URL and set into the uh, root of this project and also add some uh, path aliases. So in this case, we are saying every time we start an import with uh, at forward slash, we are actually importing from the source main. So from here, and also the path analysis from importing uh, files from the shared uh, folder. So that was it for the TypeScript configuration. And now we can go ahead with the development. Actually, we are missing another uh, subfolder under the main process, which we are gonna call lib. And this lib folder basically will contain a series of function that we are gonna use as an, an API to interact with the file system to save, read, and write some files that will represent our uh, notes that our application will display and interact with. Great, so now that we have all the folders that we need, we have to update the electron vid configuration. So this file basically contains a vid configuration for every process that Electron use under the hood. So a vid configuration for the main process, another one for the preload script, and finally another one for the renderer process. So here we have to specify the how to resolve the path analysis that we 
uh, basically defined inside the TypeScript configuration. So let's go ahead and let's define our resolve property where we are gonna uh, specify the aliases. So here we are gonna specify, for example, for the main process, the lib folder that we have just created and this will be uh, resolved under the source main lib. So this one uh, right here. So uh, the main process need also to resolve the head shared folder, which will be resolved under the source shared folder. So every time that we specify head shard, this will be resolved under source uh, shard. Uh, great. Okay, so we need to do the exact same thing also for the renderer process, but this time I'm going to paste all the configuration that we need. So as you can see here, we specify the add shared folder, one for the hook, one for the assets, one for the store. And basically they are mapped uh, nicely with all the folder that we define just like here. Actually, we are missing another configuration, which is called assets include, where we basically uh, want to import all the assets uh, from source render assets and defining all the possible folders and files. This will permit us to import, you know, all the uh, files that we define inside here as an asset and not as a source code. Uh, great. That was it for the electron bit configuration. And now we can move on and starting by adding Tailwind CSS to our project. And let's uh, install Tailwind CSS. We need to run yarn and dash D Tailwind CSS, post CSS and auto prefixer. Next, we are going to run MPX Tailwind CSS in it dash B, which will create the Tailwind config.js and the post CSS config.js. Great. Now let's open up the Tailwind configuration file. Inside the content property, we have to specify uh, what file Tailwind have to uh, look out uh, where we are going to use Tailwind. So we can just uh, paste uh, this part right here, source render and all the file that has this extension right here. And you can see that we are basically telling Tailwind to go under the renderer folder and search for Tailwind classes right here because the renderer folders will be the only place where uh, our application will live. And so all the styling will live uh, only here. Uh, great. Next step will be updating the index.css. So inside here, we have to import all the Tailwind directives. So the base directive components and utility for making Tailwind working properly. Then we are going to extend the layer base. Inside here, we need to use the ID selector for selecting the root uh, ID class. We are going to apply uh, hfold. Another configuration will be updating our HTML and body. We are going to apply uh, full width. We are going also to apply uh, select uh, to none. Uh, this is for avoiding to select uh, text inside our windows because, you know, um, win desktop application does not have, you know, generally don't have this kind of user experience where we can select text. So we are going to uh, disable it for, uh, for our application. Uh, then we are going to apply also a transparent background because we want a nice blue red effect uh, as a background of our application. Uh, we are going also to apply a font mono and also an anti-alias text to make the, the text looks uh, smoother and nicer. Also, we are going also to add text set to the color white. 
and finally we are going to apply overflow hidden to hide all the content that will overflow the window content great great job so uh, that was it for our index.css configuration and now i guess that we can uh, we need to install some other dependencies so let's clear out the console and let's add for example tailwind uh, merge great we also need to install clsx and finally we are gonna add also react icons Okay, great. So let's see why I've just implemented this library. And let's move inside the utils folder. Let's define a new file called index called index.ts. And let's define a function called tn. Let's extract some arguments, which will be of type class value to import uh, this class value from uh, CLSX. Uh, great. Uh, then we want to uh, run tailwind merge with CLSX of these arguments, basically. So like this. Uh, obviously, we need to import this the CLSX and also we need to import a uh, tailwind merge from uh, tailwind merge. Uh, great. Uh, this function will be useful uh, later on when we have merge some custom class name with default tailwind class name and also applying conditional class name as well. Uh, great, great job. So let's go ahead inside the app.tsx and inside here let's define span element where we are gonna say we're gonna say hello from electron and we are going also to apply some class name like a text of for excel text blue 500 and also we try to center the, this text by using flex uh, h uh, full items uh, center and justify uh, center. Yeah, let's try to run our desktop application. So let's run yarn dev. And you can see that it's working properly. We have our um, string, which say hello from Electron. And we can see that Tailwind is working correctly. And also our Windows is rendered correctly. So I think that our next step will be adding some window customization. But for doing that, we have to go inside the main slash index.ts. Okay, let's go ahead and let's start to adding some custom uh, styling to our window. We want to apply the center set to true to have like our window to be uh, centered when we open up for the first time. We want the title to be um, a note mark, which is the name of our uh, note taking application. We want to disable the frame. Vibrance is set to under window. Uh, this is needed for applying a background blur effect. And also we are going to apply a visual effect state set to active. We are gonna set the title bar style set to hidden. So this property is for basically hiding the out of the box top bar that every Windows comes out with. And also we want to adjust our traffic light position and we are gonna set uh, the X value set to 15 and the Y value uh, set to 10. Great. And that was it for our styling. Now, if we try to rerun our application, you can see that we have a nice blurred background. Actually, here is not super 
uh, visible. So let me just move it in a place that could be more visible, like inside a second desktop. And you can see that the windows had this nice uh, blur effect, which will, uh, for me, it's super cool to have. So we can also see that the top bar has been hidden and the traffic light has been uh, adjusted a bit, but we don't actually have a way to move our window around, but we will see how we can be able to drag our window around. Let's move into the renderer project and let's start by defining an app layout.ts6 component. The first component that we have to define is the sidebar, which will be used for uh, containing all the list of our nodes. Uh, the sidebar will be an aside element and will basically have as class name, uh, we are gonna have basically, we are gonna use Tailwind Merge where we are gonna apply some default styling. We'll have a fixed width of 250 pixel. We'll have some margin top set to 10 pixel. A height set to 100% viewport height uh, plus 10 pixel. And finally, we'll have an overflow set to auto in order to render a scroll bar when the content inside overflow the parent container. And we also want to uh, apply some custom class name that we are going to receive from the uh, props. So let's define the component props of a, an, a site element. We can extract the class name from here. Uh, great. And we can also extract the children uh, in order to be rendered side this element and finally we want also to spread these props uh, here uh, great this is for uh, you know building a reusable component and we are going to apply this pattern for every component that we are going to define throughout this project great so this is for our sidebar uh, layout component the right part of the sidebar that we are going to call content, which will contain basically our uh, note editor. So this basically will be uh, a simple div element and we are going to do the exact same thing we did before. So we are going to extract the children, we are going to extract the class name and all the props and we are going to spread all the props here and also apply a class name where we are going to use a Tailwind merge to merge a default style, which will have flex set to one to take all the available space except the, uh, the one takes from the sidebar. And then we are going to use overflow set to auto. And also we are going to merge it with the class name that we take from the props. We have to also to uh, define the children. And actually here we have to return this div. Okay, so actually um, for this content component, we want also to have a ref prop. And so basically have our component defined like this. Let's define also a content display name. So basically here what we did is forwarding the reference of an HTML div element and getting all the props of a div element and then basically uh, going here and passing the, the reference. This will be very useful, this reference prop, because we are going to reset the scroll of this content component when we you know, navigate through different nodes. We need also another component called root layout, which will be the container for this sidebar and content component. 
So the root layout will be basically um, a main element. We are going to do the exact same pattern we did for the other component. So let me just paste all the props that we need here. Let's uh, spread out the props. Let's define the children inside the main content. And then let's define the class name, which will use also the Tailwind merge, where we're gonna merge the default style, which will be a flex with flex row, because the sidebar and content are basically two column layout in a row. So we are we are gonna use flex row, and we are gonna also take total height of the screen. And obviously we are gonna merge this with the class name that we get from the component props. Uh, great, that should be it for our layout component. Uh, what I'm going to do now is exporting everything from the main entry point file. We can go ahead inside the app.tsx. Instead of rendering this, we can just define our uh, root layout with our sidebar. We're gonna set the text read sidebar as the content of the sidebar. And also we are gonna set a class name where we apply some padding. And also we are gonna apply some border. This border will be red color. And this is just temporary, just to understand how these two components will be laid out. And also we are gonna have our content. Actually here we can remove this dot and use the hat symbol and this should work. Let's go back and let's define a class name with, with some border and border blue uh, 500. Great, so Let's see the, the result. Great, you can see that we have on the left side, our sidebar with these red borders and on the right side, our content uh, component with blue borders. And here uh, by setting like that margin, we have some room to give to these uh, traffic lights. So great. Uh, I think that we we did a pretty good job so far. So we can go ahead and actually uh, remove this and also this uh, border because obviously we don't uh, need it for our final application. And what we are going to do is to add some custom uh, Tailwind class for the content where we are going to set the border left and we are gonna give a background of using the zinc color, particularly the 900 variants with the opacity set to 50. And also we are gonna set the border left set to a, a white 50. Uh, sorry, not 50, but 20. You can see that now we have a darker color for our content while our sidebar has the softer gray and, and actually more blurred. And we also add this border left to separate, you know, the sidebar from the main uh, content. A uh, great, great job. Okay, so if we run again our application, uh, we can see that our window cannot be dragged around even if I'm clicking on the top side of the window. So we need to figure out a way to let the window be draggable when we want to drag it somewhere in our screen. So in order to do uh, this, we're going to implement a new component, which we are gonna call draggable top bar.tsx. This will be basically another component. We are gonna pass some class name 
So basically we want this header rendered on the top side of our application. So if I run again our Electron Hub, we want the header be rendered like here. So in order to do this, we're going to position this component absolutely and set the inset to zero. Inset zero means that we set the property top left, uh, right and bottom to, to zero. We are gonna give this header an eight of uh, eight, which should be 32 pixel. And we are gonna give a transparent background. And we actually can use an autoclose tag here. And great, so this is our header, like our draggable top bar. And now we need to import this uh, top bar inside our app. Uh, first off, I'm going to rename this to become a constant variable. I'm going to use this syntax right here to be more compliant to the other components that we are defining. And here, uh, we're gonna use a fragment and move all this content inside uh, because we want the draggable top bar be rendered uh, outside the, the root layout. So here, declare our draggable uh, top bar. Actually here, if we want this to be extracted from the components, we have to go inside our index.ts and extracting a draggable top bar here. So now we can remove this, go here, and let's extract the draggable top bar. Okay, actually, uh, if we go back to our draggable top bar, I want to uh, outline where this uh, top bar will be uh, rendered. So we're gonna set a uh, border for with some border with red color. And now if we uh, switch to our application, you can see that the draggable is just right here, but it's still not draggable. In order to make it draggable, we need to open up the index.css and adding some new custom CSS here. Specifically, what we are going to do is to select our header with the tag selector. And I'm going to define the WebKit app uh, region uh, to drag. And this will allow our header component to be dragged around. We have to define set the WebKit app region to no drag. This is super important, otherwise our button will not be clickable. This is the proper way to allow our window to be dragged correctly. So if we switch back to our application, now if I hold click on this draggable header, you can see that I can move my window around. While if I click inside other part of the window, obviously the windows cannot be uh, dragged around, but only if I click over here. Great, so we have our draggable uh, top bar and we can actually remove the border. So now it should look like more clean. It's working as we are expecting to the application to work. Great job. Next step will be implementing the, the two action button for creating a new node and for deleting a node. And we'll place this action button rows over here. So the first component that we are going to define will be placed under a button folder. And inside this button folder, I'm going to create a generic action button component. This will be will be rendered as a button. Next step will be uh, extracting all the uh, props of a button, so like this. Component props of button. Wait, pass these props over here. Uh, great, so next we want to extract the uh, class name and the children and pass the child, de declare the children inside the button content and next 
define the class name. We are going to use Tailwind uh, Merge. Uh, we are going to define a default style. So our button will look something like this. We'll have a horizontal padding of two and vertical padding of one. We'll have uh, rounded borders. Then we have uh, some border. And the border color will be of zinc 400 with opacity set to 50. Then on over, we are going to apply a background of color zinc 600 with opacity always set to 50. Then we are going to apply a transition uh, colors and a duration set to 100. And also we are going to merge with other possible class name we received from the other props. So this will be represented as our um, action, a generic action button. So now I'm going to define an index.ts to export uh, our action button from here. And then going inside the root index of our components and export everything inside the button folder. Uh, great job. So let's close some tabs. Okay, at this point, I'm going to create a new node button.tsx. Great, this new node button will use our previously defined action button. And we can actually import this from uh, components. So add slash components. Uh, great. As content, we want to display an icon, which I have already selected, and that we are going to uh, extract from React icons. The icon itself is this loo file signature. So let's define it here. And also let's set the class name. We have a width of four, h of four, and the text set to zinc uh, 300. We want also uh, to extract all the necessary props. Uh, but actually what we can do here is to inside the action button and define the action uh, button props and reuse this over this type over here. And at this point, we can do the exact same thing here because the new not button will uh, is basically an action button. So we can pass all the props over here. The next step will be obviously exporting this uh, new node button. Great. And now let's define the delete node button that is X. It's basically the same thing we did for our new node button. So let's define an action button over here. Uh, great. Uh, here we can import from components. Okay, great. Next, we are going to extract all the props. So action button props and passing these props, writing these props over here. And finally, we are going to use this icon, FA reg trash can. So let's set as the content of this component and let's set some class name to a width four h4 and a text of zinc uh, trian uh, great let's export this component over here with not button and finally we are going to implement under the component folder a new component called action action buttons row .psx, which will be the container for these two button it will basically be a div containing these two buttons that we have defined. First will be the new note button, and the second will be the delete note button. Uh, we can update the import. And here we want also to extract all the props 
from the div from a div element and spread it out here great great job okay now that we have this action button row we can import it inside our app.tsx so inside the sidebar we are going to remove this sidebar string we are going to define our action button uh, row applying this class name let's justify between and a margin top of one and actually we have to export this action button row great so here we can just import from add forward slash components let's switch back to our application and there you have it our action button row with the button for creating a new node and the other button for deleting the selected node great job okay great so our next step will be adding a list of nodes to display inside our sidebar we're gonna start with some mock data and later we are gonna to implement a file system based approach to retrieve the notes from directly from the file system but for now we'll start with some mock data okay so to implement this we have to go first inside uh, our shared folder and define a new file called models.ts which will contain the models of our application we're going to define two specific uh, type the first will be a note info, which will basically represent the preview of a note, such as his title and his last edit time. So we want a title and we want also the last edit time. This last edit time will be a number since we are going to use milliseconds to represent our uh, date second type that we are going to need is note uh, content will be a string but this type over here will represent the markdown stored inside a note great that is for our models uh, now let's go inside our store and let's define a new folder called mocks and inside this mocks let's define an index dot yes and over here we are going to define some fake notes that we are gonna use let me just paste some notes i have already created so we have basically four notes the first one which is a, a title of welcome and a last bit time of basically now and other three notes and you can see that we imported the note info model directly from the shared folder a uh, great great job okay now let's close all this tab and let's move on inside the components folder and let's define a component called note preview uh, list.tsx so this note preview list will be represented by an unordered list html element and for now we don't want to display anything inside so now let's import our notes from slash or slash mocks and over here let's track our notes mock inside our unordered list let's iterate over these notes and let's map it over a basic string uh, let's return a list item and as a key we are gonna use the title of the notes okay great um now let's export this note preview list here great and uh, let's import this component by the app.tsx and we are going to add this note preview list under the action button 
uh, row. We want to set some uh, class name where we are going to set some margin top and a space between those nodes of one. And also we have to take in input uh, these props that we define over here. So let's define the component props on an ordered list HTML element. Uh, let's spread these props over here. And we should be good to go. So let's switch back to our application. And you can see that our nodes are here, even though they are not displayed nicely. So what we are going to do now is extracting a specific component for rendering each of these nodes with a proper design. So what we are going to do is to define a new component called node preview. .sx. Okay, the first thing that we are going to do here is exporting a type called node preview props, which will be represented by the node info that we defined before. We are going to also add a property is active to know if the current node is selected as the node to be rendered inside the editor. And this will be a boolean. And finally, we want all the component uh, props of, uh, in this case, a div element. So let's get all the props over here. And let's spread out these props inside the div element. Great. So over here, we can now extract different props such as the title of the note, content of the note, the last edit time, the is active prop, which we by default set to false, class name, and the other props. Uh, great. So now we are going to define some styling for this div. We are going to use the CN function that we just defined uh, before because we are going to have some default tailwind style, some conditional styling, and also we want to merge everything with the other styling that you can receive from the consumer point of view. So here, let's start by defining our default styling. We are going to have the cursor set to pointer, so that every time we get over a node, the cursor will be set to a pointer. We add some padding. that rounded border, that the transition colors, the duration of the transition to 75. And then we are gonna add some conditional styling. For example, we want the background we set to add zinc 400 with an opacity of 75, only when this node preview is active. So it is the one that is being shown on the right side editor. We want to apply also an over effect of PG Sync 500 with an opacity of 75 when this uh, node preview uh, is not active. And finally, we are gonna merge everything with the, with the class name we received from our parent consumer. Great job. So, as the content of this node, we are going to have an h3, which will render the title of the node. We are going to apply some style, such as margin bottom, font set to bold. And we want also to truncate the text if it's too long. And then we are going to also apply a span element, where we are going to render the last edit time. And let's set some class name to have the render as an inline block. All width, uh, margin bottom set to two, text set to super small, font set to light, and text set to left. A uh, great, great uh, job. And now we can start using this node preview. But before we need to export it. dot slash node preview. 
great. So now if we head back to our node preview list here inside of rendering this list item, we can use our node preview and passing basically everything in it. So here we can do just like this. And we have to specify also a key. We are gonna use the node uh, title plus the node plus edit time. And let's take a look at the result. So as you can see, now we have our node. And every time I over, uh, over a node, we get this nice transition effect. The thing that I don't like right now is how this last edit time is being formatted. We want this to be formatted in a proper way. So to achieve this, let's go ahead and let's go inside the util folder and open up this index.ts. And over here, we are going to define a date or matter, which will be equal to int date time format. And here we have to specify the locale. For now, we are gonna use n dash us and define some option. For example, the date style, we are gonna set short. For the time style, we are gonna set short as well. And for the time zone, we are gonna use UTC. And finally, we have to export a function called format date from MS, which will take number of milliseconds. And we are going to return, we are gonna use this date format and format this input we takes as input. A uh, great, great job. So now we can go back to our node preview and let's define a variable called date. And here we are gonna use the previously defined function format date from milliseconds. We are gonna pass this last edit time. And this date now will be a string that we can render over here. So now if we go back to our application, you can see that our date is formatted nicely. We have the date uh, rendered in this format, day, months, and here, and the time of the day, basically. Uh, great, great job. Uh, the last step is that uh, if we go back inside the util folder, we want this to be based on the locale of the operating system. So in order to retrieve this type of information, we need to ask help for uh, the preload uh, script. And so if we go over here, what we can do inside the context, define a variable called locale, which will be a string. And if we go in the index.ts over here, we are going to define this locale to be equal to the navigator.language. So the navigator is an API that will return back some default information about the uh, user agent, in this case, the, the underlying operating system, and the language will return us the uh, locale of the underlying environment. So we can start using this kind of information. So let's head back to our date formatter. And here, what we can do is the window.context.locale. Don't worry about this error because TypeScript actually is complaining about this type not existing, but I can assure you that if this variable exists, it's only TypeScript that is complaining. We can just don't worry about it. So yeah, let's move on and let's close this. And now um, we have our note review formatted based on the underlying locale. Great, great job. Okay, next step will be going back to our node preview list. And we want to handle a particular use case when we receive, like, we don't know if this node smock can be empty or not. And in case it is empty, we want to display some kind of content like no nodes yet. So in order to do this, 
let's define an if statement. We are going to say if not smock dot length is equal to zero, we are going to return this component over here. We are going to have a span which will say no notes yet. And we're going to apply some styling using tail with merge. Merge the fourth class name. We are going to extract over here. And also a default style, which will be equal to text center and a padding top of four. And also spreading out all the props. Uh, great. So now, um, if we go to our notes mock, let's remove this for a second. Let's save it. Now our notes mock is an empty array. So let's see what happened. You can see that no notes yet string here. Great. So now we can move back to our notes mock and restore our initial note. And let's see the result. Now we have our notes great okay finally since we have extracted the class name over here we have to pass it here so if we open up our note application you can see that now they are formatted nicely okay now it's time to implement our note editor and for doing that we are gonna first extract a new component which we are going to call markdown editor.esx great so then importing the component here at this point we need to figure out a way to implement this editor i decided to use a third party library which is called MDX editor, which is basically a markdown editor built for uh, React as a component, which allows us to write markdown documents just like uh, Google Docs or Notion does. There is also a live demo we can try it here. For example, if I go here and type the characters for having an heading, you can see that we have already previewed inside our editor. For example, if I want a block quote, here a block quote, everything is styled directly in the editor. Great. So now we need to figure out how to install this component inside our uh, notes application. So let's go here and open up a terminal. I will open up actually a second terminal for installing this. And we are gonna run yarn add at mdx editor forward slash editor. Great, our editor has been installed. Now we need also another package which is called Tailwind CSS typography. Let's go ahead and install at Tailwind CSS slash typography. Great. Now let's open up the Tailwind config because we need to specify the plugin over here and just add this statement like require Tailwind CSS typography. We should be good to go. Now let's go back to our Markdown editor and here let's start using our new editor we have just installed. So we're going to say MDX editor like this and we need to add some required props like the markdown and we can say for example hello from mdx editor okay now let's go back to our app.sx and let's put our editor inside the content container so let's remove this string and let's say mark down editor like this great let's see how our application and you can see that anything is rendered 
And that's because we need to apply some custom styling. So let's head back to our Markdown editor and let's add a prop called content editable class name. And this is a way to apply some Tailwind class name inside our MDX editor. First thing, we want to remove any possible outline. Then we are gonna set min age to screen to give like a minimum height of the entire window screen. Then we are gonna set max width to none. We want that every time we stretch our windows, the content to grow consistently with our window. Then we apply a text large px of 8 and py of 5 and also we're going to apply a carrot yellow of 500 to modify the uh, blinking carrot color okay let's save and let's see if anything has changed okay you can see over here we have this yellow carrot and we can start typing something you can see that we have our editor working properly. So the problem now is that the markdown is not supported. Like if I try, for example, to add an heading like this, it's not converted. This is for two reasons. First, we need to define some plugin over here because this editor works by specifying multiple plugins. The reason behind having plugin is that uh, in this way, we can select what plugin we want to bring in in order to avoid a very large bundle size. So we only gonna import four different plugins. The first will be the headings plugin to format the headings properly. Then we are gonna have a list plugin to format like numbered list or bullet list. And we're gonna use quote plugin for block quote and finally the markdown shortcut plugin that will allow us to define some markdown shortcut to define some of the markdown syntax the next step will be applying some pros to our editor these pros will come directly from the tailwind css typography that we previously installed we're going to apply these pros and also pros invert to have a dark style of this prose styling that Tailwind is going to apply. And then we will have a lot of different content that I'm going to pass here because it's too long. And basically what we had here is basically some styling for styling like the, for example, here we're styling the paragraph since we are targeting the P tag. Here we are styling the all the headings to have a certain margin. Here we're selling the block quote. Here the unordered list and so on. So now if we go back to our application, you can see that everything is working as expected. Our previous content that was saying hello from NDX editor and was an H1 is being correctly rendered. So if I go here, for example, I want X text to be uh, bold. I can select this text, for example, and with command B, make it bold. Or otherwise, I could have used the markdown syntax for the bold uh, text, like this one. Oh, actually, I have to do like that text bold. And you can see that the markdown shortcut is working properly. We have also, for example, the palette list. Uh, like one, two, and three, and also I guess the numbered list one, two, and three. Yeah, you can play around with this editor and edit your note content. But the most important thing to remember is that for this application, we are only adding this plugin and we are intentionally lifting out some other plugin like the link plugin or the code block plugin because they need a particular configuration that maybe i will leave it for another video but for now we are good to go and we have our editor working fine great okay now 
let's open up back our application and i want to show you something if i force this content to go to overflow you can see that our scroll bar are not looking so nice so we have to apply some styling to modify the appearance of this right scroll bar and for doing that we are gonna head inside the index.css and here we are gonna add some new CSS. The first class is dash webkit dash scrollbar, where we are gonna apply a width of two to modify the width of our scrollbar. Then we are going to modify how the thumbs will look like. So colon colon dash webkit scrollbar thumb. And we are going to apply a background of dash 555 and round that to MD. Great. And finally, we are going to modify the scroll bar uh, track. And we are going to apply a background, transparent background. Great. So if we go back to our application, you can see that now our scroll bar looks very, very nice. Great, that was it for uh, the scroll bar. So let's go ahead. Our last UI component will be called floating note title.tsx, which will basically be a floating text that will appear on top of the editor that will hint us of what note we are editing right now. So let's go ahead. So we are gonna use a div parent container of the content inside. We are gonna use a mock title for now. It will be note title. And we're gonna use this title the span. Let's apply some styling like text gray 400 and then let's apply some styling as well to the parent div container where we are going to apply a tailwind merge of black styling and justify center also parent class name and we also need the parent props. So let's go ahead and extract all these props from component props of a div element. From here, let's extract the class name. Uh, great, let's export this file for everything from floating node title. And now let's go back to our app.tsx and let's define this component just over here, floating not title, while applying a class name on padding top. And great, let's go back to our application and you can see that now we have our floating title. Okay, now that our application is actually complete, we have all the components that we need, we can start, move on, on implementing the interactivity for this note application. Basically, we want that uh, every time we click a note, the content of that note is displayed inside the editor. We want the note preview being rendered as active and so on. So the way that we are going to uh, implement all the interactivity for this application is by using Jotai. So let's go ahead and install Jotai. Let's clear out the console and run yarn add Jotai. Okay, so Jotai is a simple and powerful React state manager that will permit us to share some global state throughout our React components. And also we will help us to avoid re-renderings and help us also to having a better separation of concern as well as 
having a better code readability. So if you remember from before, we have this folder store where we are going to have all the Atom that Jotai used to managing his state. So let's go ahead and let's create a new file called index.ts. And inside this file, we are going to have all the atoms to store our application state. So let's start by defining an atom to store all of our nodes. So let's define a constant variable called notes atom, which will be an atom of note info. Actually, it will be an array. We actually need to import atom from Jodai. And the initial value for this uh, notes will be given from the notes mock. Okay, let's go here and let's import this as slash store slash mocks. So for now, we are importing some the mocked notes, but later we are gonna load the notes directly from the file system. But for now, for the sake of the tutorial of this video, let's start with some fake data. Okay, so this atom will be useful for retrieving all the loaded nodes. The second atom that we need is called the selected node index atom, which will represent the index of the selected nodes. And actually, this can be a number or it can be null in case we don't have any nodes selected. For example, when we don't have any nodes yet. Great. So we will have also a third atom called selected node atom will be a read only atom. So we are going to extract the get function and what we are going to do is getting our notes by getting the notes atom, then taking the selected node index, which will be equal to the selected node index atom. If the, the selected node index will be null, we are going to return null as well. So from here, we can extract the selected nodes, which will be retrieved by accessing the array of nodes with the selected node index. And from here, we are going to return all the info related to the selected node, uh, along with some uh, content, which for now will be something like, um, hello from a node. And we are gonna use selected node index. Great. So if we are gonna take a look at the type inferred by TypeScript, we are gonna get back the title, last edit time, and the content. Or if we have any selected node, we will get back null. Great. Now that we have defined all of these items, what we can do is start defining some hooks to manage the core business logic of the entire Node application. So let's set inside the folder hook and let's create a new file called use notes list.tsx. So here we are going to define an hook that will return the list of nodes that we basically retrieve from the Jotai internal state. So let's export use notes list. Okay, from here, what we are going to do is first defining a variable called notes, which will represent the notes that we have defined. So we are going to use use atom value of notes atom. So here, what we can do use the path analysis that we defined before. So these nodes now are gonna be a list of nodes. And this useAtomValue is for reading the value of an atom 
without uh, being interested on the, the set state function. We also need the selected uh, node index and also the set selected node index that we are gonna get from the use atom of selected node index atom. So here we are gonna have the currently selected node index and this will be a function to update the selected node index. Uh, great. Now let's define a function called handle notes select, which will take an input an index, which is a number. It will return a function, which will be actually an async function. This is an handler that we are going to use every time we click on a particular node. So uh, every time I click on a node, I want that index to be uh, updated accordingly. So uh, let's go here and say set selected node index to the new index. Actually, we also want a new parameter, which say on select, which will be actually a function, an optional function. And this on select, if it will be defined, will be run after the set select node index will be executed. So at this point, we need to uh, return some value. Uh, actually, here we are doing an equal. Great. So here, what we are going to return are the list of nodes the selected node index, and also the handle node select. Uh, great. We're going to use this hook inside the node preview list, where previously we were leveraging the nodes mock. But now what we can use is this atom we have just defined. So let's go here and define use nodes list. Actually, let's go here and update our imports. Also here we can components and remove this. Uh, great. So now we are going to extract the notes, select the note index. And instead of using notes mock, we are going to replace this with notes. Great. Also, we are going to define some new props, for example, is active, which will be equal to the selected node index is equal to the, to the node. Actually, here we have to extract the index of the current node. So here we're saying this node preview will be active if the selected node index match the uh, like the index of these uh, nodes, basically. And finally, we are going to define an onclick handler where we are gonna execute the handle node select by passing the index. Great. So now, if we go back to our application, you can see that I'm able to select a node. And every time I select a node, it goes basically in an active state by applying this color to in that that node is selected, even though the content is not getting uh, updated. But as you can see, everything is working as expected and also the nodes are displayed correctly. Okay, the next step will be updating the floating node title every time we change the selected node and also the content of the note itself. So let's close this tab and let's get back to floating note title. And here, instead of using a fixed string, what we are gonna use is the use atom value of the selected note atom. And here we are gonna have the selected note but this note actually, let's remember that can be undefined. So in case it is uh, not defined, 
we are going to return now and if it's defined we are going to return the title of the node great so if we go back to our application you can see that now the title of the floating node title is updating accordingly so if i select the node 2 the floating title is updating correctly but actually if i click on the first uh, note something is wrong because our floating node title uh, is not appearing and that is because i think we have a little bug inside our store x file here we are doing something incorrectly so we are saying if not selected not index but so here instead of say not selected not index we have to be more specific and say that if this selected node index is null or undefined, then we will return null. Otherwise, that operator will return you know, false, even though the selected node index is zero. So if we go back to our application, now it's working correctly. Great. Okay, as a next step, we'll be updating the content inside the editor to match the real content of the selected node. So let's go ahead and inside the hooks folder, let's define a new hook called use markdown editor.psx. Inside this hook, we are going to take the current selected node by defining use atom value of the selected node atom and basically for now we are going to return the selected node so now this hook can be used inside our component markdown editor so we can go here and use the use markdown editor and extract the selected node but let's remember that this selected node can be null so in case this selected node is null or undefined we are going to return null so we are not going to display anything great the next thing that we need to update is the markdown content which will be equal to the selected node dot content and also we have to update the key to selected node dot title so here by setting this key we are saying that every time we have a new node this editor has to be re-rendered from scratch so the the entire content will be updated correctly with the expected content inside great so let's save and let's open up our application and see if everything is working as expected We have node 2 selected and it say hello from node 2. If I select the node 1, it say hello from node 1. Here we have hello from node 0 because this is actually the node with index 0. But you can see that the content is displayed correctly. And actually you can go here and type something. even some markdown like an adding or a block quote or you know some old text but obviously as soon as we change note and we go back to the previous note all the content will be lost forever because we don't have any way to save our content soon we will see how to save the content of the notes inside our file system in order to be retrieved later on and don't lost our changes great okay before moving in i want to show you a quick thing that maybe you didn't notice so if we go back to our application you can see that if i scroll the content and now i open up a new note can see that the page like the note content editor gets scrolled so it's very important 
to reset the scroll every time we change node. So in order to do that, what we need to do is the following. Go back to the app.tsx and here we are going to define content container ref which will be defined to be a use ref as an html div uh, sorry html div element which by default will be null we need to import the use ref hook and now obtaining the reference to this content by saying ref equals to content container ref great so at this point what we are going to do is to define a function called reset scroll where basically what we are going to do is to take the content container ref take the current value and if it's defined we are going to set the scroll to zero zero or it means we scroll to the top and this reset scroll needs to be passed to the not preview list so we need to execute this function every time we select a new node but who is in charge of selecting a new node is the not preview list so what we can do is defining a not select prop here where we pass the this reset scroll function and now let's go inside the not preview list we need to extract is on select from the component props. So uh, let's go here and let's define an export type not preview list props, which will get all the props of a UL list HTML component, but we will get also this on select. Now we can replace this with the not preview list props and here extracting the on select. And this on select, if you remember from before, can be passed to this use not list hook, which will execute this on select after we select a new node, obviously, if it's defined. So now, if we go back to our application, you can see that if I scroll a little bit and then change node, you can see how the scroll is set it back to the top. Let's do it another time, change note, and we get back to the original scroll. Great, great job. Now let's move on and let's open up our application. What we are going to do now is adding the interactivity for creating a new note and the relative function for deleting a note. Great, so let's close some of this tab. And now let's head into store index.ts and here we are going to create two new items, one for create and one for deleting a note. So let's start with the creation of a note. So let's call it create empty note atom. And this will be actually a writable atom. So the first parameter will be null. Then we are going to extract the get and set function and we are going to execute our function. So first thing that we have to do is getting the list of our nodes by saying gets nodes atom. So we need to read the list of our nodes. And from here, we have to define a title for our node. So for now we can use a note and using basically uh, a sort of index by uh, calculating how many nodes we have uh, until now and then summing uh, one. Great. Then we are going to create our new node to be equal to node info. And here we need to pass title and also a last edit time. We can use date.now to get the milliseconds of the current time where the node has been created. Great. Now we have to update the notes atom to add the newly created node. So let's say set notes atom. And we want the new node to appear on top of the other. 
So we are going to say new node. And actually, what we want to do here is to uh, spread all the previous nodes, apply a filter here. What we have to do is get the current node and say that if the node title, and we want only the nodes that are different from the new node dot title. So in this way, we are keeping only the nodes that doesn't have the same name of the newly added node. So this one is for updating our list of nodes. Another thing that we want to do is update the selected node index atom and set it to zero. The reason why we are using zero is because our new node will be um, at index position zero. And generally, when we create a new node, we want uh, that to be selected. So in this way, we know that it will be at index number zero. And with this trick, we are going to select that new node. Great job. So that was it for our create empty node atom. We are going to have also a relative a function for deleting a node. So delete node atom will be also a writable atom. We need to extract get and set. And we need also to define this function. So here we have to get our nodes. So we are going to get the nodes, right? Then we get the selected node by saying get selected node atom. Uh, obviously, when we say delete node, we want to delete the node that is currently selected. Great. Here, we need to check that if we don't have any selected node, we can just return because there are any nodes to delete. And then what we are going to do to update the list of nodes, so the nodes atom, and say that apply this filtering where we say not dot title is not equal to selected node dot title. So here we are saying let's filter out only the nodes that have the same name of the selected node basically. And after having removed our selected node, we don't want any node to be uh, selected anymore. So what we are going to do is to set the selected node index atom and set it to null. Uh, great, great job. Okay, now the next step is adding those handler to the relative button. So let's go inside the new node button. And over here, let's take the create empty uh, node, which will be retrieved by using the use set atom of the create empty node atom or the atom that we have just defined before. Then we are going to define a function called handle creation, which is a function that basically will call this create empty node. And we are going to pass this handler to the on click event handle creation. Great job. We are going to do the exact same thing for delete node button. So let's go here and say const delete node, which will be equal to use set atom of delete node atom. We have to import this. Actually, here we can remove this renderer, right? And then we are going to define our handle delete which will be a function, which will execute the delete node. Ah, uh, great. So finally, we will pass the onClick event handler to execute the handle delete. Great job. So let's test these changes now. Let's go back to our application. So now if I click over this button, a new node is created even though the content is not, you know, correct. But you can see that now the nodes are correctly added. We can add as many nodes as we want. If I hit the delete button, the nodes is selected. And 
we don't get any node selected anymore. So we can delete this node 8, node 7, node 6, and node 5. Great, great job. As of now, our application is almost ready, but it misses the most important part, which is storing our nodes inside the file system in order to persist the data, even when the app gets closed or quitted unintentionally and so on. So the current implementation that we have is inside the store index.ts, where we are using Jotai to store basically our nodes, but currently we are using fake data. So what we actually are going to do is to persist our nodes in the file system. In particular, if I open up the terminal, we are gonna store our nodes inside a folder called notemark, which I have already created for now. Um, and this folder is going to be declared under the user home directory. In my case, is inside user forward slash Jonathan forward slash note mark. We are gonna have multiple note, like for example, note one, and we are going to use the .md extension in order to highlight the fact that this file is a markdown file. Great. So the point is now understanding how we are going to interact with the, with the file system. So basically we are gonna use the Node.js file system API, which provide a multiple uh, function to read file or, you know, getting file information, writing file. But the main important uh, thing to understand is that since this is our restricted API, which can be accessed only inside a Node.js environment with privileged rights, all this kind of operation will be executed inside the main process. Uh, in particular, if you recall from before, we have our main folder and under this main folder, we are going to define under the lib folder, a set of function to write, read, and, you know, getting notes information inside this note mark folder that we define to store our notes. What we are going to do now is first defining this function to interact with the file system. And then inside the preload script, we are going to define some IPC function that will permit the, the render process to communicate with the main process to perform this kind of operation. Let's go back to our application and let's close these tabs. Now we are going to work inside this lib folder and I'm going to create a file called index.ts. Inside this file, we are gonna be in a Node.js environment and we are going to define all the function to read and write this uh, notes file. So the first thing that we have to do is installing a third party dependencies called fs extra. So yarn add fs extra. So this library is a library which is built on top of the node file system library, but it is enhanced with some utility function and also it is promise based. So it will help us having a, a nicer experience working with the file system. Great. Actually, we need also another library called lodash. So let's install it. We are not slash the lodash. And this library will provide some utility function, for example, throttling and the bouncing function or some JavaScript based utility function. Uh, great. So here I'm gonna start to define a first function that is gonna be called get root directory or there. And basically what this function will return will be a string that will return the root directory of our node application. And as you might recall, this will be placed under our home directory under the folder note mark. Great. As you can see here, I used the function omdir 
which return the string path of the current user's home directory. And it comes from the module OS, which can only be accessed from an OGS environment. Also here, I don't like to have this art coded string. So under the shared folder, I'm going to create a new file called constants.ts and I'm going to export some constant variable like app directory name, which is gonna be called note mark. And we also gonna have the variable file encoding, which will be equal to UTF-8. Actually here I made a typo, encoding, uh, great. So now this variable can be reused and will help us avoid, you know, having code duplication and hard coded string uh, and so on. Uh, okay, let's close this tab. And here now we can use app directory name, which will come from the shared library under the constants uh, file. The second function that we are going to define will be the function get notes, that will be an async function that will basically read all the file with .md extension inside our uh, directory note mark. So what we are going to do is first extract our root directory by calling get root dir. Great. So now we have to uh, check that the directory note mark actually exists. And if it doesn't exist, we need to create it. And for doing that, this kind of operation, there is a function called ensure dir uh, that comes from the module fs extra, which will do this kind of operation for us. Great. At this point, we are sure that this directory exists and we need to read all the files that are stored inside this directory. So let's define this variable notes file names and here we are gonna use read directory that comes from fs extra we will pass the root directory and also some option like the encoding where we are gonna use file encoding that will come from the sharded constants and also we are gonna specify with file types set to false Great. So now, basically inside this uh, variable, we're gonna have a list of strings representing all the file names stored inside the root directory. The next step will be filtering out these notes file names to include only the files that have the MD extension. So all the other files will not be treated as notes. So let's define a variable called notes. Let's get these notes file names and let's filter it out with uh, taking the file name and ensuring that the file name uh, ends with the .md extension. So now basically we have filtered all the kind of files that doesn't have the .md extension. Great. Okay, at this point, we can be tended to return these notes file names. But actually, what I'm going to do is extract another function called get note info from file name, which is gonna take a file name. They're gonna be a string. This will be an async function and we return a promise with a note info inside. Okay, so basically what this function will do is taking a file name and basically mapping to uh, a note info type. So here, what we need to do is basically calling the function stat that comes from fs extra. And this function takes in input a file it will return some statistics about this file. So here we go under the root directory and select this file name. 
and the result will be stored inside file dot great and so now we have to return note info as expected from the return type so we need to return a title which is gonna be basically the file name without the .md extension. So uh, for doing that, we are gonna use this uh, regular expression that will remove the .md extension from the file name. And then we also have to return the last edit time, which is gonna be the file stats .mtime. So this property basically return the last edit times in milliseconds that the file was edited. Great, so now we have our get note info from file name and we can call a function to map every notes to the respective note info class. So in order to do that, we are gonna call promise.hole and we are gonna map with every uh, notes and call the function get info from file name. Great, so what we did is uh, execute this get note info from file name for every notes that we have um, stored inside here. And now, if we are going to see the return type of our get notes, you can see that it returns a promise with a, a list of note info. Great. Okay, actually, let's copy this type because under the shared folder, I'm going to create a new file called types ts and inside this file i'm going to export the type of the function we just defined so get notes and it will be equal to the type of the function that we actually have defined we need to import the model and now this get notes can be set as a type get notes as a type declaration the reason why we did this is because this function type is gonna be used in uh, multiple files and so we need to have a shared type great the next step will be going inside the main folder under the main index file this is basically the file where we are creating the window and setting up all the uh, listener and events and we scroll down and we go under the app dot when ready and above the create window statement we are going to access the epc main which basically is the channel where the main process will be listening for uh, this kind of events we are going to use the function handle to listen for the events get notes and every time basically we are gonna receive this event get notes we're going to execute the function get notes that we previously defined actually let's update uh, this import to be uh, head forward slash lib to leverage the path analysis and if we go back here the first parameter that this npc handler expect is an event but we are not interested in the event of this uh, function. We want all the arguments that can be passed through this uh, IPC channel. And we can take these arguments, uh, like using the spreading syntax. And here we can use a TypeScript trick to get the parameters from the get notes type that we previously defined. And then spreading out these arguments just like here. So, this is a super useful trick so that every time we change this type, TypeScript will, you know, it will act as a reminder that we need to uh, update these arguments right here and also the arguments that this function expects. I think that this is a super useful trick, even it's a little bit advanced but it will come in handy later. Uh, great. So now we set up a listener uh, from, the, from the main process from the get notes. 
but obviously there must be someone that will invoke this get nodes. And the one who will be in charge of invoking this event will be the preload script. So let's go under the index.ts of the folder preload and below the locale definition, we are going to define the get notes function, which will take all the arguments that the function get notes expect in input get notes. And here we are going to use the EPC renderer dot invoke function to call, you know, the function where the EPC main is listening, passing all the arguments that it expects. So here we have to import the EPC render from Electron. And here we have to add a comma. So now what we basically did is exposing using the context bridge exposing main word under the context object, this function get notes that basically takes all the parameters of get notes. And when it gets called, will basically invoke the function get notes with all the arguments that this function expects. This is basically a sort of proxy to avoid exposing the entire EPC renderer object to the renderer process. And basically we are going to do this trick over and over again to basically expose all the API that this application is going to use to interact with the file system. Uh, great. So the final part will be go inside the index.d.ts and define this newly added uh, function, which will basically will be of type get notes. So basically in this way, we should get the type inference when we do window.contest.getNotes. Great, great job. So at this point, we can close all this tab. We can go back to our uh, renderer source store index. So here now, instead of loading this notes mock, we are going to define a new function, which is going to be called const load notes. This function will be an async function since we are using a promise based API. What we can do here is loading all the notes stored in the file system by calling wait window dot context dot get notes. Great. And now inside the notes, we should have all the uh, list of notes info, basically by doing all the steps that we are just seeing. Another thing that we want to do with this function when we read them from the file system is to sort them by most recently added. So we are going to return these nodes by using the sort function, which is going to take A and B, which are the two uh, nodes that are going to be compared. And we are going to do B dot last edit time minus a dot last edit time. So this is a way to compare two nodes and getting the one that is most recent. Uh, great. Okay, but now we have to call this function load nodes inside our nodes atom because we don't want to use the nodes mock uh, anymore. So what we are going to do is actually define another atom called nodes atom async, which is going to be an atom with type note info, an array of note info, or a promise of note info. And this atom is going to have as his initial value, the result of load notes. So the result of this function. At this point, what we want to do is to use this notes atom async inside the original notes atom. But here we are mixing some async stuff with sync stuff. A way that Jodai allows us to uh, handling async stuff is by using the 
unwrap function. So let's remove this item right here and let's use unwrap. It's gonna come from import uh, unwrap from Jedi Utils. And this unwrap takes in input an async atom. In this case, not atom async. Basically, the way that unwrap work is that if this promise is resolved, will return his original value. So the value that is stored inside these load nodes. But uh, when it's currently pending, what we can do is taking the previous value and just return it. So anytime that we call this atom async, if it's going to be pending because it's reading from the file system, we can return just the previous value, which can be a list of not info or undefined. Obviously, this undefined must be handled by all the React components that are using this nodes atom. In fact, you can see that now some of the atoms that are reading from the nodes atom start complaining because it say that nodes now is possibly undefined. So here, what we can do is saying that if the nodes are not defined, for example, we just return null as the selected node. Also here, we can say, if nodes are not defined, just return. And also here, if the nodes are not defined, just return. So great, we have fixed all of the other that were, where TypeScript were like complaining that something could be wrong if we didn't handle it correctly. But now, if we open up the terminal and run this command, yarn, type check uh, web. Uh, this command basically parses all the files and searching for possible TypeScript error. In fact, it says that some files are throwing some error, like the node preview list.tsx. Let's see what is actually going on. And you can see that nodes here is possibly undefined. So here, as the other case, we are going to return null if the nodes are not defined. And also here, instead of doing this row comparison, what we can do is leveraging the function is empty, passing the nodes, and is empty will come from uh, lodash, import is empty from lodash, which is much more cleaner. So let's run again our type check. So on the renderer process, we don't have any problem, but we have to run it also for the main process. We don't have any sort of problem. Great. So now what I'm going to do is to close our application and start it from the beginning to see what is going to happen. And you can see how we don't have any nodes. Because if I open up my terminal, if I run pwd, I'm under the note mark folder. And if I run ls, we don't have any file. So let's close this application. And for example, let's create two files, note1.md and note2.md. And let's put this content, hello from node one. We are going to redirect this content inside node one.md. And we are doing the same thing for the node two. Okay. So now inside the folder note mark, we have two files. If we're gonna print the content of the node one, for example, we have this content. Great. So let's go back to our terminal and let's run our application from the beginning. And you can see how our nodes are magically appearing and are directly read from the file system. Obviously, if I'm going to select this file, you can see that the content is actually not correct because for now we are just reading the 
like the file names and some information like for example the date that this file was uh, last edited and now the next step will be fetching the content of these nodes to be rendered inside uh, the editor so let's do it great at this point let's go back to our main lib and here uh, we are going to define a new function called read note which will be an async function which will take in input a file name which is going to be a string and from here we need to extract the as always the root directory and then return basically the content of this node. The way we are going to do this is by using the function read file from fs extra and we are going to pass the root directory forward slash file name along with the extension that we expect which is .tmd and then we are going to pass the encoding to be the file encoding uh, great so now we need to reapply the same pattern we did before so let's open up our explorer let's go inside the main index file and here let's define the epc main dot handle the event read note basically what we want to do here is like execute the function read note and obviously here we need to take all the arguments of the function which will be file name as a as a string here we need to spread the argument and pass it here actually here uh, we cannot do this because we actually need to define the type of our function so let's go inside the source shared types and let's define an, a new type called read note we'll take an input the title of the notes which will be of type note info of property title and basically we return a promise with inside the note content which is basically a string so now this read note type can be used uh, both here need to import it and also can be used uh, as type here inside read note and you can see that now even if we remove this type declaration we can see that this file name is still being inferred as a as a string uh, great so we can close this we have our handle for the epc main we can close this tab and at this point we can go back to our preload script and define the epc invoke uh, function so here we are going to define the read notes which is going to take all the arguments of the parameters of read note and is going to return pc render dot invoke the event read note and passing all the expected arguments we need a comma here so now basically here we as we were doing in get notes we are exposing the function read notes that basically will invoke the event uh, read note uh, by using the epc renderer channel we have also to update the uh, interface so read note will be equal to read note great okay now let's go back to our store index file and we need to use this read note function that we actually define 
inside the deselected node atom because now we are using has content the hello from node which is basically some fake content so what we are going to do here is basically define a new variable called node content which is going to be an await uh, actually here we have to use the async declaration in order to use await so here we are going to await window dot context dot read note and passing the selected note dot title great and now we can uh, remove this fake content and passing the note content as the real content of the of the notes okay actually we have a little problem now here because this selected note atom is actually returning a promise so we want to extract the uh, synchronous atom uh, just like we did for the notes atom so we just basically define first a notes atom async and then use the unwrap function from jota utils to extract the the synchronous notes atom so what we can do is to uh, remove the export from here and make this the notes atom async and then define a new atom which is going to be selected uh, node atom which is going to use the unwrap function to the selected node atom async and here when this async atom will be pending because it will be uh, for example fetching the content from the file system what we want to return is or the previous content but the problem is that the previous content can be null or undefined and in case it is null or undefined we can return empty note which is going to have an empty title uh, an empty content and as last edit time we're going to set date uh, dot now uh, great so this selected not atom now um, is going to hold a sync value, a synchronous value. So we don't need to use a sync await because we just use the unwrap function and we just get back a proper value and we just return back a, a note or a null value in case we didn't select any note. So now if everything went well, we should be able to read the content from our notes. So let's run your dev and let's launch our application. So let's try to select note one but everything seems wrong so when this kind of error happen you can open the dev tool and just try to figure out what the problem is and here we are getting window.context.readnote is not a function okay let's see why i think that inside that index.d.ts under the preload folder we can have missing something but everything seems correct i think that something is missing here and this is just the error so basically we have an s here and we basically add a typo so let's run again our application let's try to select a node and it seems to work let's select node 2 and the content is actually correct because we get hello from node 2 and here hello from node 1 and also the floating title is updating correctly um, to check if it's really working what we are going to do is open up our terminal and let's try to put some kind of other content inside our node for example i'm going to use uh, an adding to which i'm going to say hello from note one and i'm going to set, set this content inside the note one dot md and i'm going to do the same thing for the note two but using an ending three here with three hash symbols great let's minimize the terminal and let's relaunch our application 
Okay, let's try to select not one. And you can see that we get a low from not one with an adding two and a low from not two with an adding three. So we are actually reading the content of the notes correctly. And we obviously can still uh, add our content inside, like making bold and whatsoever. But the problem is that this content is not persisted on the these files. So our next step will be saving the changes that we made in our nodes in the file system. But actually, we are going to implement this by implementing an auto-saving system, or uh, we're going to save this file when the a node get deselected. So let's do it. OK, the first thing that we have to do is to go inside our shared folder, open up the types, and define a new function. The function that we are going to define will be write note, and is going to take a title, which will be of type note info of property title, and is going to take also the content that we are going to save inside this note, which will be of, of type note content. And we are going to return a promise with basically void, because we are not returning back any kind of value to the who is going to call this function. Next step will be open up mainlib index.ts and define a new function called export const write note, which will be of type write note. And this will be an async function that is going to take file name and the content. We are going to extract the root directory of our application. Great. I'm also going to console log some useful information. In this case, I'm going to log writing note with the file name of the note that we are going to write. So here we are going to execute write file from fs extra. We have to pass the path of the file we want to write, which will will be located under root here for slash file name dot md. We are going to pass the content we want to write and also specifying some option like the encoding, which will be equal to the file encoding. So and that's it for our function write node. This is everything we have to do for, you know, saving some content on a file in the file system. The next step that we are going to do is to define the EPC main handler. So let's go here and define EPC main handle. And we are going to call this write note. And this will be a function that will take some arguments. We are going to take from the parameters of write note. And we are going to execute the function write note from our library, passing all the arguments that this function uh, expect. OK, now let's head to the preload. So we are going to define our write note also here. And I guess that we can leverage in GitHub Copilot. And then let's go inside the index.t.ts and let's define our write note function, which will be of type write a note. Great. OK, now let's close this tab. OK, now let's head into our store slash index. And here we are going to define a new atom called uh, save note atom, which will basically be a writable atom. So here we are going to use the async function where we are going to we are going to extract the get and set function. And also we are going to need the content which are we are going to call new content, which will be of type note 
content and this function is going to execute okay here we need to import the node content and here we need to extract all the nodes so let's get the nodes atom then let's get the selected uh, node so here if we don't have any selected node or the nodes are not defined as always we return because we can perform any action so now we can basically save this data on disk so let's call note, and here we have we have to pass the title and the content so select the note.title and the content will be the new content uh, great also what we want to do is update the saved uh, notes uh, last edit time in order to show the date of the notes uh, being updated every time it gets saved so here we are going to use the set function to update the notes atom and basically here we are gonna we are going to use the map function here we are going to extract the current node and here what we are going to check if if the notes.title is equal to the selected node title what we want to do is to update these nodes by just merging the previous data and updated the last edit time by setting the date and setting the current uh, millisecond and here we are going to return the note so basically this is the note that we want to update so if this is the note that we want to, to update we update the last edit time otherwise if it is another note we just return it okay so now we can start using this atom save note and we are gonna use it inside the use markdown editor inside this hook we are gonna first extract this action save note by using use set atom and we are going to take the save note atom that we have just defined and this will basically be a function to save our notes another thing that we need is the editor reference so this editor ref will basically hold the current markdown that is stored as a string inside the, the editor so here we are going to use a use ref by passing mdx editor methods and for initially we will pass it an our value let's import this ref from react okay so now we have to define two function the first function will be called handle auto saving Basically, this function will be triggered every X seconds and will save our nodes automatically. So let's start by defining our function first. So this will be an async function that will take some content, which will be of type uh, node content. So here, what we need to do is to first check that selected node is valid. So if it's not if it's null or undefined, we will return. Otherwise, we perform the saving action. So let's first add a console log useful for understanding when this function will be triggered. So here we are gonna say auto saving and we're gonna also bring the selected node.title to understand what nodes has been saved. And then just call the in the await we are gonna use the save node that we defined here and we just need to pass the content let's go here lx export the editor reference and also the handle auto saving now let's go back to the markdown editor and here let's extract the editor reference
So editor reference, great. So basically this editor reference will be uh, attached by the, the ref prop. And then we need to extract the function and the auto saving, which will basically will be triggered every time the content inside the editor will change. So here we have the uh, event listener on change. The problem with this approach right here is that every time we type something inside our editor, we will perform a saving action, so a, a file system operation. Every time we, we type something uh, with our keyboard, which can be uh, very, very fast. So the way to actually better handle this end a lot of saving is to throttling the entire function. We can go here and extracting the function throttle uh, from lodash. And then going here and take this function and put it inside. Uh, we need also to specify when this throttling must happen. So we want the auto saving to, for example, to be executed every three seconds. So we need to pass three thousand millisecond, and we can also pass some option initial auto saving must not be triggered but the last auto saving will always be triggered okay so actually what i don't like here is this this magic value put it here so let's go inside the chart folder inside the constant and let's define a new a constant value called auto auto saving time set to 3000 millisecond so that we can it can be reused here without having any magic number uh, throughout the code base so what this function will do is to execute the saving operation not every time we press some key in our keyboard or we perform some kind of change inside our editor, but it will only be executed every third second. So this will prevent to execute too many operations on the on the file system, which can be you know very daunting and uh, affect the performance of the entire operating system and the application itself. So now everything should work as expected so uh, let's try to run our application and let's take note one for example okay first let's try to insert some content so this is some new content okay so you can see that here we triggered a writing note so actually our content has been saved but for actually being a secure of that let's change note and let's go back to our note one and you can see that content has been saved another way to check this is to open up the terminal you can see that here we have our two note between the content of note one and you can see that it has been updated correctly so our saving system is working correctly Let's go back to our application because I want to show you something else. If we open up the dev tools, we have the console here. Let's uh, just clear it out. Now you can see that when this auto saving will be triggered. So if I start typing something very fast, you can see that the content is not updated on every kick stroke, but it's actually executed every three every three seconds and this prevents us to as i was saying to avoiding to uh saving on the file system every time we perform an action on our keyboard great uh, we want to uh, define also another handler because we want to save our notes uh even when we basically they select a note and we go to uh, to another note because it can happen sometimes that we are typing and we change immediately note and the previously note gets not saved because the the auto saving does not have 
uh, enough time to be executed. So what we can do is going here and define an handler called handle blur, which will be an async function, which is going to be executed every time we select a new node. Okay, so inside this function, what we are going to do is to first, if the selected node is not defined, we are going to retard. And then uh, what we are going to do here is that uh, every time we go from uh, a particular node uh, to another one, we must be sure that the previously queued autosaving function uh, must be cancelled, otherwise we risk to overwrite the content of another node. So the way to do this is to go here and take in the handle autosaving function that we defined here and we run the function cancel. So as you can see from the documentation, this will throw away any pending invocation of the debounced function. So when we uh, deselect and select a node, we want also to uh, save the previous content of the, of the nodes that we were editing before. In order to get the content of the previous nodes, we can leverage the editor reference, get the current value and get the markdown content. So here we can say that if the content is uh, not null or not undefined, we are going to perform the save note operation and passing the content. So now we can export this function handle blur. At the same time, we can go back to our markdown editor. And you can see that here we will have a non blur event. So here we can extract the handle blur and execute it uh, here. Uh, great. Let's try out our application. Okay. So let's select node one. Let's say that I want, for example, to delete some content and put in something else. Okay, you can see that now the two nodes are not overwritten accidentally. And yeah, we can put our content more fantastic content uh, inside here without running into any overwriting problem. Now that we can select our notes and edit our notes, what we are missing is like implementing a way to create a new note and at the same way implementing the button deletion. So we can start with the button creation. So Let's head into, so first let's close all of this stuff. Uh, let's go inside the types because I'm going to create a new type, which I'm going to call create a node, which is going to take actually any parameter and will return a promise with some node info particular we are going to return the title of the newly created node but at the same time we want also to return a uh, false because the the process of creating a new node can also be abort and we won't we don't want to return uh, any title in that case but we just return false so uh, let's head back to our uh, main lib index file and here I'm going to define the function create a node, which will be of type create node. This will be an async function, which doesn't take any parameter. And here, first thing is as always extracting the root, uh, the root directory. Then we, since we are creating a new node, we must be ensure that the directory node mark exists. So we do this by using the function ensure here by passing the root directory of the application. So now uh, when creating a new node, we want to show to the end user a dialog to basically select the name 
uh, of the notes and also the folder of the of the notes to do that we are going to use dialog from uh, electron and this dialog right here is the native dialog that are implemented by the underlying operating system so we are gonna see it in action uh, when we are going to having the implementation done so here we are gonna use the dialog dot show sorry uh, dialog dot show save dialog which is basically the dialog that opens up when we want to save a file and here we can pass some option for example a title and we can name it for example new note we can pass a default path which will be the uh, root directory and then we can also set a default name for the newly created uh, note uh, in general we uh, many application use untitled or naming a file that has not been saved with a particular name uh, great uh, then we are going to specify a button label so the button label to confirm the operation and we are gonna name it create uh, then we are going to uh, specify some properties for example we want to uh, show the overwrite confirmation so in case we are trying to create a note with a file name that already exists we want the user to be aware that is going to overwrite the content of that note and then we are gonna use the shows tag field to false because we are not interested with any tag uh, field and also we are gonna filters we are gonna apply some filters in this case we want the files that are going to be created by this dialog uh, must be only of type with the extension uh, .md and we can do that by specifying first a name that we are going to call uh, markdown and then the extension which is gonna be md this will ensure us that every file created must be with the extension .md a uh, great great job actually uh, when this dialog has been closed it will return some uh, result for example the file path of the newly created file and also a cancelled event so cancelled is basically a boolean that tell us whether or not the dialog was cancelled so here what we can do inside an if statement say if the dialog was cancelled or we don't have any file path we just return false but we want also to console log something on the console and say note uh, creation cancelled okay here now we have the complete file path of the newly created path and we want to extract the file name and the parent directory to extract this information we can use path from the library path and use the parse function to parse this file path and this will return an object which inside will contain a name the name of the file which will rename to file name and also the year property which is basically the parent directory we need the dir directory to check that the file has been saved inside the correct folder because if the file gets saved outside the not marked folder uh, the application will not be able to load that file so what we are going to say is that if the um, rn uh, directory is not equal to the root directory of our application we are gonna display a message box or a message native dialog with type error with title creation uh, failed and also a message that is going to say all notes must be saved under root directory and then say avoid 
using other directories. Great. So this will be our message. And then we will return false since our creation has basically failed. We can also go ahead because now we ensure that the file has been created in the correct directory. And first we can just console log that uh, the node has start to being creating. So creating node. We are gonna also log the file part of the of the node. And then we are going to execute the right file from fs, oops, write file, and we're gonna pass the file path, and we're gonna pass as content, empty content. We don't want the node to have any content inside when it is newly created. And then finally, we are going to return the, uh, the file name. Great. At this point, let's go inside the main.index file, and here, I'm going to define the epc main dot handle name the event create node. This will take all the arguments parameters of the function create node and is going to execute the function create node. Then we go inside the preload and define the create node, which will be basically here we have to import the create node, here we miss the comma. And so basically, as always, we are invoking the, um, the event create node to uh, signal the main process to execute the create node function. Uh, great. So we had also to update our global interface and say, create node, we type uh, create node, uh, great. Okay, now let's go ahead inside our store. And here, let's search for the create empty node atom that we already defined, but that was using fake data. So here, what we are going to do is to remove this fake content and replace it with uh, await uh, window.context.create node. Actually, we have to specify the async keyword here. So here, basically, we create the node, and inside this title, we return or the file name of the node or false. In case we didn't create anything, so if not title, we are going actually to return and yeah, actually, this is the only thing that we need to update because the other remaining parts will be left as they were before. So great. Uh, now what we are missing is going inside the new node button. And actually here we need to update this handle creation handler. We need to specify that it will be an async function and specify an await here. Now we should be good to go. So let's go here and let's restart our application. Okay, now let's try to click on the new node button. And you can see how the native dialog, in this case on macOS, appear. And it suggests me to name this node untitled. And you can see that the default path is already note mark. I can name this note my note and create it. And you can see that the note has been created. And I can put actually some content inside, like hello from note, hello from my note. If I open up the terminal, clear it out, and do an ls. You can see that we have the, the newly created node. And if I print the content, you can see that everything is working fine. Great. Actually, I want to show you something else. You can see that if I try to create a node and I, I hit 
cancel, nothing happened. And also if I try, for example, to save a new note inside, for example, my desktop folder, and I try to hit create, you can see that this uh, message box appear and say all notes must be saved under users Jonathan Notmark and avoid using other directories and anything happened. So great, great job. Okay, at this point, the last piece of functionality that our application uh, is missing is the delete note functionality. And yeah, let's go to implement it. But first, let's close all of these tabs and let's go inside our shared types. Here, I'm going to define a new type called delete notes. And this will be a function that will take a title and will return just, uh, in this case, will return a boolean to say if our note has been deleted or not. Great. So now let's head into to main lib index. And here I'm going to define a new function called delete a note, which will be of type delete note. This will be an async function that will take uh, the file name. And here, as the other function, we have to extract the root directory of our application. And then we're going to use again the dialog. And now we are going to show a message box of type uh, warning. The title will be del delete note. The message will be are you sure you want to delete it and specify basically the file name? Sorry, the question marks should be attached. Uh, we are going to specify also two buttons. First will be the delete button and the second one will be the cancel button. And here is important to note that the first button will be attached to the index number zero. So zero is delete button and one is the cancel button. And this will be uh, super important for the following properties, which will be the default ID, which we are going to set to one. So the default ID is basically the index of the button in the buttons array, which will be selected by default when the message box opens. And also for the cancel ID, the cancel ID should be mapped to the cancel button. Okay, so at this point, we can say that uh, we can extract the response that we get back from this dialog. And here we can say that if the response is equal to one, that means that the deletion has been uh, canceled. So we are going to log uh, not deletion uh, canceled. And we basically are going to return false because the, the deletion operation has been aborted. Otherwise, we proceed with the deletion. So we are going first to add a log which is going to say deleting node file name of the node that is being deleted. And then we are going to call the remove function from FS extra and passing basically the root directory and the file name along with the extension, which should be a .md file. And then we can just return true. Great, so this is our nodes deletion operation. So now we should go back to our main index and define the epc main dot handle event. And we are going to call this event delete note. And actually here we can just update the suggestion from copilot. Here we are going to use delete note and passing all the arguments. Let me check that everything is working, yeah. Uh, great. Now let's head into the preload script 
and define here as well the delete node function. Uh, here we can just um, improve the suggestion given by Copilot. Uh, great. And finally, I'll update uh, index.t.ts and define this delete node. Okay, at this point, let's go inside the store and let's find our delete node atom, which is this one. So here, what we need to do now is basically call the function window.context.delete node, passing the selected node title. Obviously, when we are going to press the button delete, we're going to delete the node that is currently selected. And here we can first we need to declare this as an async function in the async keyword. And here we are going to extract the result, which we are going to call is deleted, which will be a Boolean variable, which can be true or false, obviously. In case it's not the operation has been aborted, we can just return. Otherwise, we basically uh, leave everything as is, because if you recall from before, here we are basically filter out the deleted node. So basically removing the nodes from the Jotai internal state. And here we are basically uh, the selecting uh, any uh, node. So we want any node to be selected after we just deleted the currently selected node. Uh, great. Last step will be go inside the delete node button making the handle delete an async function and just await for the delete node uh, since this now will be an async function. So now we should be have everything setting up. So let's run our application and let's test the deletion. So now I have selected the the my note file that we previously created and let's try to delete them. So uh, the message box appears and say, are you sure you want to delete my note? Uh, if I hit cancel, anything happen. But if I hit delete, the note is currently removed from the note list. And also if I use my terminals and type ls, you can see that my note is no longer here. We can just make also another test. Let's create a new node, which I'm going to call delete node. Create it. And I'm going to type, please delete this node as the content of the nodes. Okay, now let's switch back to our terminal. Let's do an ls. Here's the delete node file that we just created. Uh, if we go back to our application and delete the note, you can see that has been uh, correctly deleted since uh, it's no longer here. So great, great job. Okay, so now let's close all of these tabs. And I want also to add a little bonus tip. If we open up our application, I want to show a welcome note in case a user does not have any notes, so he can get a clue on how this note application work. So in order to do this, what we are going to do is first minimize all of the open folders. Then under the resource folder, I'm going to paste um, a static markdown file called a welcome note. And this is basically pre-built uh, markdown note that I came up with, where I basically explain how note mark uh, works. And we want to show this note if the, as I was saying, if the user have any notes to display. So in order to achieve these features, we need to go back to our source main uh, lib folder. And we are going to update the get note function to handle this case. So what we need to do after we get all the notes from the file system, 
and we filter out all the files that are not in the .md extension, we're gonna add a new if statement where we are gonna say if is empty notes. Actually here we have to import this is empty, is empty uh, from Lodash. If we don't have any nodes, we are going to add this welcome note. So let's start by logging uh, some information on the console. So console.info no notes uh, found. Uh, creating a welcome note. Great. So now we need to retrieve the content of this welcome note.md that we just created. So let's go ahead and let's extract the content of this welcome note. Here we are going to use the read file from FS Extra. And actually here we can import the path of this welcome note. Import welcome note file. From here we need to use the absolute path. So uh, dot dot slash dot dot slash again dot dot slash resources and then specify the welcome note dot md and since this is an asset file we are going to append a question mark with the string asset uh, this string right here is a feature provided by vit to managing uh, static assets so this will be now as you can see a string containing basically the path of this welcome note dot md and we can reuse it here for reading this file. So here we're gonna say welcome note file and we're gonna pass the encoding set to the file encoding. Uh, great. So now we have the content of this welcome note and the next step will be create the welcome note. So await, write file. We are gonna specify the path of this file which will be the root directory forward slash welcome note.md or actually we are going to name this uh, welcome.md then specify the content of the file and finally the encoding which will be the file encoding and then we have to perform another operation which is pushing this newly created node inside the list of nodes that then we are going to map to uh, note infos. So here, what we have just to do is to do nodes.push and then the name of the node, which will be basically welcome.md in order to be uh, parsed by the get note info from file name. Actually, here we are repeating the welcome.md uh, string two times. So this is a good use case for extracting a new constant variable, which we are going to name welcome note uh, file name, which will be welcome.md, and here replace it with uh, welcome note file name, and here same thing here note file name. Uh, great. So everything now should be work as expected. So open up our terminal and you can see that inside our note mark folder we have two nodes but if we have two nodes the welcome note will not appear because we have just some uh, notes to to read from so i'm going to remove these two nodes so uh, remove node1.md and node2.md great now we don't have any content and so if we try to launch our application, yarn dev, you can see that our welcome note is displayed correctly. And if I'm going to open it up, you can see that inside we have these reformatted content that explain basically how not mark works. I think that we are just completed our application. The last step that I want to show you is how to 
build this application for production and how to actually build it for different operating system. So let's close this file and let's open up the package.json. Inside the package.json, you can see that we have different scripts available. And amongst those scripts, we have the build script that basically first run a type check of the entire uh, application and then run an electron with build for building our application for production. We have also a post install script that basically runs the electron builder for install the all the app dependencies. And this electron builder basically works uh, with the file electron builder.yaml that we are going to see soon. And then we have three different scripts, one for Windows, one for Mac, and one for Linux. These three scripts will generate a distribution folder which will contain all the installer for installing our application as a desktop application. And this actually can be released in the different store, for example, the App Store in case of Mac OS. So let's give it a try. But first, we need to update our Electron Builder YAML configuration. So inside this configuration file, you can see that you can manage how the final build will looks like. For example, you can set uh, an application ID, a product name, uh, all the file to include or excluding the, from the final build, all the resource folder and so on. So we can leave it like this because it's already uh, pre-filled with a configuration that work for us. So let's open up a terminal. Let's clear out the console. Let's minimize it a bit and the first script that we are going to run is yarn build. So you can see that it's running the type check. Everything is correct. And now you can see the scripts has created the build for production and is using Vite as a bundling tool. And you can see that it generates this file under the out folder. If we go here, uh, it basically generate three bundled file for every process, one for the main process, one for the preload, and one for the uh, for the renderer project. Uh, great. We can also run this production build by running yarn preview. Sorry, by running yarn start. And our application is working fine. That was it for the application. The last script that I want to show you is built for Mac. Since I'm using a um, Mac OS, I'm going to run yarn build uh, Mac. And this should generate a separate folder, which will contain all the necessary file in order to this application to be installed inside our Mac OS operating system. And it will take a little bit of time to generate all the files. So let's wait until it's done. Okay, the process has been completed and you can see that the output uh, is this, this folder. Let me uh, increase this a bit. You can see that it generates all the necessary file in order to install the, the application. And amongst them, we have Notebook, the version of, of our application, and we have the uh, DMG file, which is an installer for to install this application as a Mac OS desktop app. So if we are going to run it, we are going to have the application installed inside our operating system. Great, great job. Okay, guys, so that's it for our Node application and for this video. Down in the description, you will find the GitHub repo for this project and also a link to my Discord channel for getting in touch with me and also for Ask Me Anything. As always, if you like the video, please leave a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and we will catch to the next video.